Brown. Thank you, uh, and good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for having me, and thank you, Sushil, for setting the stage for this uh, for this next next discussion because. Uh, and it is important for you, we're going to talk a lot about the embolic protection systems, and it is important for you to note my, my uh, conflict regarding the Claret device. So we already heard uh, the, uh, the stroke rates. Um, we just heard them in the earlier days of the high risk and uh, extreme risk um, average, a weighted average of about 4.2%. These are major stroke disabling strokes, and 3.1% with more contemporary devices in perhaps even lower risk patient population. And I think as you go forward, and we, what we just heard from Dr. Kodali, where he showed us a disabling stroke of under 0.5%, and it's important to note that cerebral embolic protection devices during TAVR have been shown to have some implication and, and important reduction, but none of it reached statistical significance because remember, this is a rare event and you would require thousands of patients before you can see that the line of the forest plot falls in the right place. The way to interpret this is that for every 28 patients assigned to an embolic protection device, one death or stroke event could be averted, and this is mostly stroke events. And it is important to note that because the stroke, while we are thinking about stroke at one week, stroke at 30 days, very important is this periprocedural stroke still not reaching the statistical significance that we're looking for, but if you look at this, if we're really going after the periprocedural events in the first, let's say, even up to a week, we would still need a much, much larger numbers of patients to actually show that a cerebral embolic protection device, such as the only one that's available at the moment, which is working and has had a clinical study, would make an important uh, difference. But having said that, take a look and see where this forest plot is putting you. And if you are the patient, where would you want to be? I'm sure in towards the use of a cerebral embolic protection device. It is also important to note that based on the histopathological findings, that the frequency and the distribution of the captured debris is tremendous when you look at it under the microscope. And the fact of the matter is that some form of debris is found in 95, 98 plus percent of those patients in whom uh, debris was collected. And when I see this and when I hear about even the surgical um, aortic valve replacement, I wonder why aren't we employing these kinds of devices on the surgical side as well, given that these important things that we might not be able to pharmacologically uh, uh, change, such as thrombus, which happens in a rare event, if you think about this, the foreign body, the amorphous calcium, the valve tissue, these are not manipulated pharmacologically, but rather technically or mechanically with the device. So if we look at the important debris in cerebral filters, the number of hits or abnormal findings on the transcranial Doppler, and then the cerebral um, uh, new lesions in the MRI, we do see a much, much larger dif differential, a, a much bigger uh, uh, as, I, as I showed you with the debris, the important high intensity hits that we see, and then of course the new uh, lesions by MRI. And we already heard about, it's not really about the size of the lesion, it's the location and what the luck of that patient is of where that debris is gonna go. So it is very, very difficult to understand the implications of these important um, surrogate markers. So the Claret device was actually uh, FDA approved in June of 2017 for use as an embolic protection device to capture and remove thrombotic, thrombus or debris while performing a transcatheter aortic valve um, procedure. But note that this is the reason why the FDA gives this is because that is how it was studied specifically in the Sentinel study. 
But the panel have really pointed out the very, very important issues with this particular device, as well as the clinical trial and the data that backs back this up. There was definitely an important lack of correlation between the DWI, uh, the MRI imaging, and the neurological outcomes. And I think that's something that we all understand is very, very complicated and difficult to evaluate. And very important is that this particular device does not really uh, cover all of the territories, and there's some protected, and there's, of course, unprotected territory based on the fact that the filter only covers two-thirds of the, of the uh, area that we are looking at of the, of the large uh, vessels. And then, of course, while the debris capture is desirable, the clinical significance is still unclear, especially given that this trial did not meet its primary endpoint as far as the um, uh, DWI uh, MRI imaging for which it was powered for. There are current devices that are being developed, some in development, some have uh, actually halted some of the development or are re, re, uh, regrouping to try to find ways to, to look at this. It's important to look that um, CE Mark is, is in the Keystone and Claret and as well as the Edwards Umbrella and then of course these other devices that are available. And there are now other very interesting new um, uh, devices that are even coming across with a EMBO liner or pro, uh, one called pro, Prot EMBO and Embolizer, and you can see these are all uh, in interesting filter devices to try to uh, really cover the, um, the greater vessels to try to uh, make sure that we have less of this important complications. And the hemodynamic flow and, the, and how it works and where the, the, the cerebral debris and showers are, are uh, being uh, addressed is very different depending on the different devices. And the one device for which we have the most amount of data for in Sentinel, you could see that of the three major vessels, only two are, are, are protected. And these other devices have had their own issues as far as making sure that there is good protection across all of the vessels. But the most important issue that we have had is the fact that despite all of this and because of the fact that the stroke rates are decreasing, we're not really seeing the great enthusiasm across the board, especially here in Europe, in embracing these important protective devices and most likely because of the cost. So let me just share with you because of the cost of the device. It is important to show that the largest contributor of cost to TAVR in the, the partner study was stroke. And if you take a look at it, of course, you can see the cost about $16,000. This was the work that was done by Suzanne Arnold based on the uh, clinical trials. And if you continue to look at this, stroke is always a major driver of cost because not only is it because of the disabling and the issues that happens in the patient going down the line, but it is actual um, care of that patient acutely with their stroke as well as the chronic care that that patient will require. And it is also important that if you, we look at the index hospitalization and the effect of stroke on economics of TAVR is really not just at the hospitalization where there is that important 25,000 plus cost to the acute care of that patient, but then after discharge, these costs continue to line up and get higher and in the longer term, even if you go from a mild cognitive impairment to mild dementia, there's a very, very important additional important ongoing cost to the healthcare system. So while this is a rare event, it's an incredibly costly and chronic condition that the healthcare will continue to have to deal with and pay for, for which we don't capture that quickly and, 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 and in a very, very great way in our clinical trials. And it is also important to note that while we go to the lower risk strata, in my mind, stroke becomes even much, much more important as, as we, as a asymptomatic, let's say very healthy individual is not expecting to leave the operating room after a TAVR or a SAVR with 
any kind of a disabling or less functional life than what they had before. And if you survey patients, most will tell you that they would, disabling stroke is certainly not anything that they would ever want. They'd rather die than to have a disabling stroke, but certainly this is very, very important issue. But as we move to this lowest strata, the cost to the patients, hospitals, payers, and the society is definitely rising. There's no question about it. More and more patients are going to become eligible. And the only important thing is that we've got to make sure that this increased risk of score is not, stroke is not mitigated. And so what we need to do and what the CMS has been mulling over is to think about this add-on payment to physicians performing TAVR that would help cover the costs of using cerebral embolic protection. I can tell you that that was the biggest issue for us in our institution where we found that if we use cerebral protection that we would actually continue to lose even more money uh, in the patients, we lose money when we, we, we do TAVR in our hospital hospitals, and it was really this add-on payment that came on um, that hopefully will increase and, and help, and this was made effective in October of 2018, uh, and it's a new ICD-10 code, and what this means is that the additional payment to cover the costs using the embolic uh, protection is likely to influence, hopefully will influence how we as US operators uh, look at this and it allows for this add-on cost and I think the maximum new technology add-on payment for this is about $1,400 for the Sentinel device. We'll, we ourselves could say, well, we want to use embolic protection in every single case. The truth is that when you Three evaluate minutes. patients and when you talk to, to investigators, they will tell you that you cannot, based on the fact of the anatomy and, and, and uh, access, they're, they're, it's about, about 60 to 70 percent of the patients for our, in our uh, institution are fitting the Sentinel device, and when they do, we move ahead. It is important to look at this as far as what the patient is thinking about, the provider, the payer, and then importantly, the society. And the objectives are different, believe it or not. I believe the objectives should all be the same, that we should avoid stroke and disabling, whether disabling or non-disabling, on everyone. But that's not how payers, hospital systems, or providers think about that. For a patient, they want the heck uh, uh, the m most important personal health benefits, and this really is mitigating stroke at all costs. In providers, though, they really are looking at this fee for Two service, minutes. and for them, is there is is the question is the per episode care and what that means for the payer with an acceptable device cost, we could have a potential avoidance and more impactful long term additive costs of these important silos of care. And then lastly, for society uh, healthcare systems, there is this very important cost over quality equation um, that could identify important um, issues like protected TAVR as the dominant uh, way to move ahead with growth of TAVR. And we're hoping that this is not, this should probably move into the surgical evaluation as well. To, to summarize what I'm saying is that, yes, is it the data or the money? They're both an important factor. The data is not absolutely great. The money, obviously, a very important issue for us in the United States. The add-on payment, the bundled payment has helped us, but the implementation is definitely um, associated with, it, it is easy to use, I can tell you that. Uh, the effectiveness in clinical and radiological strokes have not been conclusive, and that is the reason why people are just saying, well, it just doesn't happen to me, and I don't need this, and, I, and by the way, it's not uh, that important that the clinical trials didn't really show the evidence, but the fact is that you will capture emboli and debris, and it's much better in the filter than in the patient's brain. There's no question that we need safer devices, to protect uh, the entire brain that don't interfere with the delivery of other transcatheter valve techniques and certainly um, 
or clinical trials for evaluation of the next generation of those uh, of those devices would be needed but the very, very important thing is that if we want universal use, we've got to figure out a way to cover the cost and have it be reimbursed. And then, of course, large randomized clinical trials will be needed if we really, really want to know that we are reducing important stroke and making an important impact because we certainly did not have those in the initial trials that, we, uh, that brought these uh, devices to, to light. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, until this uh, randomized control trial is done and the results are out, what are we doing? What we should be doing? Um, from everything you have gone through, you think it is, uh, this particular moment, it is uh, cost effective to do it on everybody? Should we be selective? And what, what are the selection criteria? So, um, if I were to say we should be selective, then we would have had to say, well, who was the patient population? Unfortunately, there was not a single predictor of, uh, of important clinical events that we could uh, evaluate in the Sentinel study for stroke. Uh, uh, what was it? Which, what Was it a patient type? Was somebody with a prior stroke, et cetera? So if it's an unpredictable event, um, then I think you really can't ration it and say we should use it in just the highest risk patients because the worst thing you would want is that low risk patient to have that rare event of a stroke. Um, is it cost effective? It's a very, very good question and important cost effectiveness hasn't been able to be done based on the fact that we've never had large enough clinical trials to show the very important reduction of events. So it's really about the idea of, do you want a seatbelt on if you're, if you're, um, you're traveling high speed down the highway? And I would say yes. And so the, the difficult answer to your question is that we don't know, we don't know, but we believe that at the end of the day, if you're capturing the debris and the clinical endpoints are in the right direction, that why not use the device? And certainly, even if you avoid a rare event, at the end of the day, it could be cost effective. So in our institution, every patient is evaluated for a Sentinel device before TAVR. And I would say, I'm hoping that we could design studies on the surgical side for that same exact reason, because if you want to reduce your stroke rates, maybe that's a way to go. Okay, thank you. The Dr. Mekhan, the yeah. use uh, of uh, such uh, devices, uh, routine uh, use uh, in clinical uh, practice is uh, controversial, or not? I, I believe it is controversial because yeah. we don't have, obviously we don't have, it's really a, a um, uh, we don't have clear cut evidence uh, with, yeah. with uh, statistical reduction in uh, disabling important stroke, but we do know that these embolic protect the, the, the embolic protection device that we studied that has been studied in clean tavi in in the work that was done by Nicholas Van Meegan as well as Sentinel device by Sushil Kodali and Samir Kapadia together show the directionality of the clinical events in the right direction, not in the wrong yeah. direction. So that's incredibly yeah. important. After that is. Uh that uh, a special uh, category of uh, persons uh, where the use of protection devices is uh, clearly necessary. I, a special category. Yeah, so, you know, maybe it's a good question to ask uh, our colleagues who perform a lot of these. Is Samir out there, Samir Kapadia? Samir, is that, do you, I mean, I would say scientifically you really can't say that you should choose a certain patient. But let me see what Samir Kapadia does and what George does and so what, you know. In Cleveland Clinic, uh, we are using in 100% of patients, uh, if possible. So when I say if possible, few people do not have access or very tortuous uh, subclavians or 
uh, anatomical reasons, but otherwise we are using it. The reason is that, as you said, that there is no predictability that who will have stroke. 99% of the filters have material inside. And uh, if you have a stroke and if you didn't use it, what are you going to tell the patient? That why did you not use the device if you use it in X number of patients and not in other number of patients? So these are the challenges that we face. Right. So we are using it. And luckily, last year in 465 patients we used it, we didn't have a single stroke. Year before that, in 500 patients, we had four strokes. So this is, a, of course, retrospective analysis, but this is the reality. So that's why we are using it in all patients. So Sheila, and so then Sheila, maybe George, maybe you can tell, and, and also Nicholas. Yeah, I, we're, we're doing similar. As long as anatomically suitable, we're using it. Um, it, it's also uh, a, in the U.S. and especially in New York, it's a, it's a marketing thing. We have uh, patients, the internet, it, it, you know, the companies have done a good job of doing it as well. And patients, their biggest complication is a fear is a stroke. So, you know, if I don't use it, the patients will ask, why aren't you using it? So they'll go to another center that will use it. So there's those components on top of the data, the money and everything else. There, there's, from the patient perspective, they want everything done to prevent a stroke. Well, I, so I have the same policy. So it's a default. We, we use uh, cerebral embolic protection in all our patients, unless there are some anatomical limitations for the use of the te technology. Um, I think, yes, the data are not strong enough to really make uh, the device mandatory because there is no uh, in randomized trials, the, the, there is no clinical benefit. But on the other hand, if you look at the retrospective analyses from, from Ulm, from Rotterdam, from, from Cedars-Sinai, it is consistent that uh, if you compare the protected patients with the unprotected patients, you have a, a, a 70, 60 to 70 percent risk reduction in stroke. Uh, I think nobody is disputing that there is cerebral, uh, that there is debris dislodging to the brain in almost all patients. Young, old, low STS, high STS, everybody. So if we have tools to uh, prevent that debris for, from entering the brain, and you cannot predict which part will end up where in the brain and which will have a clinical effect, but if we have the tools, why would you not use it? I mean, how many cars can you buy without a seatbelt? How many? Zero. It's mandatory. So I think you need to escalate it to a societal level, and it is just unacceptable. We have the tools, then I think we need to use it. And, you know, you can, you can ask yourself, okay, but then why does a valve need to cost 20,000 euros? No, it, 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 the valve should be cheaper. And with the money that you save on that, you should be using accessories that make a difference because there is a clinical stroke, okay, but we've been talking about personalities that change after Tavi. And this is real. Patients' personalities change when there is cerebral embolization. And it's hard to put your finger on it and to put a number on it, how many, but it happens. And if you can, pre if you can prevent this from happening, why would you not do it? It cannot be a costing, and it definitely should not be a marketing thing, because then it becomes a perverse uh, discussion, right? We need to protect all our patients, not just the patient yeah. that is family or the patients you like, who is, who, or who is your private patient. We should protect yes, everyone. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, George. Good, good. Uh, Dr. McLaren, uh, thank you. Thank you.